here among friends. Um, I'm, I'm still a Roster faculty in the UC, so I, I say I'm still part of the family, um, even though I'm physically somewhere else. Emerita. Emerita. I think the Emerita. I'm a Google Yeah, I am. I'm just Emerita. It sounds like pretty cool to be in retired. But thank you for having me. And I really love this venue. What a wonderful venue. And I think we're informal enough that I was saying to Lisa, I hope it is a conversation. I'm going to say far more than you want to know and probably longer and I'll try not to. But I really do hope that you will feel so moved that if you want to insert a comment or a question, you can. Um, and, and that I would welcome that. So don't feel like this has to be so formal that we, uh, you know, I always talk, I one of the things that I study is the social organization of learning. And I always look at these environments and say, so what theory of, of learning is operating here, right? And so we try to rupture that a little bit by asking you to think with me as I share some, some, some thoughts with you. Um, as, as both Lisa and Judith said, I'm here to talk about the notions of policy, but of course my work is really about literacy and learning. And I'm really trying to think about, a lot of my work has been around what I call social design experiments. Uh, that are environments that we purposely design that are uh, informed by research and evidence-based approaches to learning. Um, but they're environments where kids can be smart. And so a lot of my time has been spent in developing kind of theories of literacy and learning that really can help ratchet up learning for what we call non students from non-dominant communities. And just as an aside, that was a term that my research group at UCLA came up with because we were struggling with well, how do we talk about ourselves or how do we talk about these communities? And I think it's still an imperfect term, but I think it's better than a lot of the terms out there because it's trying to deal with issues of power. And this seemed to, at the moment, be the placeholder for us to think about um, non-dominant kinds of communities. Um, I want to just start by just saying, even though my work has been on literacy and learning, I, if you study literacy and English learners in California, you are always doing kind of policy work, whether you intended to or not. And so part of that work has always been bumping up against policy um, in that way as we are studying issues of language learning with, with non-dominant students and English learners in particular. But then most recently, I got thrust into another level of policy that um, I wish all academics could experience, because it's a world that you can't imagine unless you've been there. And as part of President Obama's transition team, um, I went initially as part of Linda Darling Hammond's team. We were a team of 10 to develop the policies for the new administration in education. And originally I went to help with English learners, which by the way was the first time that there had been someone with that kind of expertise on the transition team. Come on in, hey, Javari, come. You can sit at the table. Yeah, Javari. <laughs> Javari's my old friend, he can sit anywhere. <laughs> um, and so, what, one thing we found there that was we were doing kind of the policy, and of course literacy has been the big policy under No Child Left Behind, and fortuitously that was really my main expertise, so I ended up working on both the English learner, the literacy uh, policy memos, and then it turns out that there were these special populations that also needed attention, like migrant farm workers. Well, I had done a lot of work with migrant farm workers, so all of a sudden I found myself writing the policy papers for migrant farm workers. And then there was this other phenomenon called out of school extended learning time. Well, fortunately, I had been doing a lot of work in studying informal learning environments, so my portfolio went from this to this, right? But what an experience it has been um, that I'm still part of conversations that really kind of help inform. My work. And, and I share that story because I was so grateful that I had been trained interdisciplinarily. That even though I was in literacy and education, but I was in psychology and cultural studies and had all these things, it was that, that kind of training and then the experience of doing work in communities that I think allowed me to develop that portfolio. 
um, in ways that I could really think about meaningful policy. So it wasn't just theoretical, it was really about the lived experiences of those communities as well. So I share, especially for the students in the room, about the importance of thinking about how you craft your life and those experiences and where it can, it can lead you. So part of my goal today, if I get through all this, is um, that I'd really like to kind of reframe the policy debate. So that when we talk about education policies, at their core they are equity oriented, that they are race, culture, gender sensitive, that they are also evidence based, um, that we talk about policies in ways that we understand there should be multiple trajectories for human beings, just like there is in everyday life. And that we should move from kind of policies of deficit, especially if we're talking about non-dominant students, to you know, hope and possibilities that I think we all have seen and been part of. So that's part of my overall goal doing policy right now. But it also means developing a new policy imagination. Um, one of the things that frustrated me, and very naively, I have to say, being at the federal level policy is that the policy was not informed by robust science of learning. In fact, Linda and I used to joke and say, you know, nobody wants to say the L word. <laughs> like learning was not part of the conversations at all. And how important it is that in terms of rethinking policy, for, especially for uh, students from non-dominant communities, about the importance of being informed by a robust science of learning that I'll talk about a little bit more and the need for a comprehensive and robust kind of literacy agenda. And squarely within that, a new way of thinking about policy for um, dual language learners, a term that I like much more than English learners. And that the new agenda should be more than just um, some basic kinds of formulas, but really should be kind of a new civil rights program for English learners. And, the, and my final point, if I can get to it, is also the ways in which we as education researchers or social, sociology researchers or whatever our discipline is, to, that we have a role in this and to see how we are implicated in perpetuating some of the old notions of learning and literacy in communities and our work and that I think that, that we need a new imagination about our role in policy making. We are not, one of the things that surprised me the most in studying the most is that we are not the go-to people. I thought AERA, the largest professional organization probably in the, in the world in terms of education research, we are not the go-to people for federal policy. They don't call AERA and say, give us your best advice about this. And that's one of the things that I'm deeply interested in as, as president of AERA. So today I want, I'm going to talk a little bit about policy, literacy policy, and a little bit of science, but probably emphasize more about dual language learners and, uh, and just a mention of some policy on um, after school and extended day students. But I want to begin with, um, with the idea of the researcher's paradox. And it's something that I've really been pushing in my presidency for eight years. I just read a column in ER on it, um, in which um, we, uh, the dilemma that we find ourselves in, if we really want to be, if we ha produce respectful research in non-dominant communities, we need to push for complexity and deeper understandings of those communities. But, but those kinds of narratives are not the kinds of narratives that policymakers want. So that puts us in a real paradox, and I really want to have been spending time on that paradox about how do we produce really robust renderings of phenomena in ways that can influence policy um, and, the, and work within that tension. Right? I think that's a really huge struggle. And um, I've been thinking about it most recently in terms of New Orleans, where AI is going to be. Because I think New Orleans presents a really wonderful case for this dilemma, right? And I, I, I'm going to go in and out of some prepared remarks that I've been thinking about, about New Orleans. Because New Orleans is a fascinating city, right? And, it, and there are so many narratives about it, about how impoverished it was, the, the school system, 
um, the crime and the poverty in there. But I think to really understand New Orleans as a case, you have to understand that it's a melding of history that is also said, it's always also been simultaneously resistant to dominant influences and practices. So you have a tradition of all cultures that are still there rubbing up against kind of new kind of dominant practices and cultures. Um, it has had a history of racial complexity and its precarious geographical and geological location, I think, can make it a really rich illustration of how accounts of community practices often lack kind of a historicized or a transdisciplinary analysis of all of the historical influences on that city, right? So if you really wanted to understand New Orleans, if you wanted to capture its dynamic cultural flow, its history of economic, residential, and racial inequities, and its mutual constitution of local, national, and transnational practices, if we were being really thoughtful researchers, we would want to study how practices travel, shift, or become hybridized in border and boundary crossing. Or we'd study what is learned in the movement across practices of home and school, school in the corner, or across new media activity um, to account for the historical, spatial, and temporal influences on this really unique ecological niche. But uh, the problem for us is that studying what takes hold in people's movement requires new sensibilities and tools and a new imagination about communities and their practices. It's a real challenge for us because there's so much to understand about human activity. And I think this is where there lies the researcher's paradox. So I found this quote from Mark Twain back in 1883 that I thought really kind of described the researcher's paradox. He it was, it was, it was writing about the endless and changing nature of the knowledge to be learned about the Mississippi River. And he said, two things seem pretty apparent to me. One was that in order to be a pilot, a man had to go to, uh, got to learn a lot more than any one man ought to be allowed to know. <laughs> and the other was that he must learn it all over again in a different way every 24 hours. And I think I twain uh, many people um, in education research are trying to work really hard to recognize that kind of ever-changing shape um, and force of the river and to kind of move away from one-dimensional representations of social phenomena that are inaccurate and that lead to these kind of reductive policies and practices. So I guess the dilemma that I'm laying out as part of this conversation with you is how do we engage in scholarship that tries to account for the dynamism in cultural communities in ways that are also useful to policymakers and practitioners? So I'm assuming well-intentioned policymakers here who want to help, but how do we then leverage what we know in ways that can, can help them? Um, and that, that leads me back to the L word, right? Um, how do you put learning back into policy and make learning kind of a cornerstone of policy making and thinking? And that's a problem I, I certainly don't have the answer to, but I think it's part of the challenge for us that part of our research we have to ensure is grounded in rigorous evidence and informed by understandings of learning and culture. So that's the paradox that I'm thinking hard on, and I'm sure many of us have, that I think complicates our lives because we, if you don't want to fall into the quick fix, the silver bullet, right, you get stuck in this paradox. So you notice in my title that I use the notion of remediation, the hyphen mediation. And so let me tell you why I use it and why it fits with kind of this conversation. For many years of my life, I have studied the effects of remedial education on students from non-dominant communities. And I think I can summarize it pretty easily. Being part of a history of remedial education guarantees that you'll be a really good remedial student. Right? Because being part of being a remedial student socializes you to a whole different set of practices, ways of being and forms of knowledge that are never part of the main event, right? And so that um, and yet be, despite knowing that, 
remediation is still the predominant paradigm used to address, come on, in, to address, to mediate, to intervene in the schooling processes of stu poor students and students from non diamond communities. And just look at the, I love to know the history and the origin of words. So let's just look at the way remediation is defined. It's an act of correcting an error, a fault, or a evil. It's an action to remedy a situation. Remediate is to rectify or improve. Uh, curative, tending to cure or restore to health, right? It's a therapeutic agent. So you see already in this term, right, in this construct of remediation, already some deficit notions at work, fixing and curing some evil, some thing that has to be corrected. Um, so instead, I counter it with a, a term that comes out of the theory of learning that I work in, and that is re-hyphen mediation. Right? So if you think about it again in terms of definition, mediate needs to come in between. Right? So instead of the remediation as a fix-it kind of strategy, re-hyphen mediation is not about deficit or rectifying something. Re-hyphen mediation is about reorganizing the functional system. Right? And when you take that from, instead of trying to fix Zeus, right? I, tr I would say, I, I know him well, I know how brilliant he is, so I can say that. <laughs> he is also still in my classes. <laughs> so I could, so Zeus, if I might use you as my foil here. So instead of trying to fix Zeus, a hyphen mediation approach would say, how can we create a functional system saturated with tools and forms of assistance so that Zeus can be smart, right? That's the difference between remediation and re hyphen mediation. And I've done a lot of this kind of social design intervention work throughout my career across different disciplines. One real quick one um, we did in mathematics. Um, when I took over many years ago a program, an academic support program for, for the provisionally admitted students at the university, one of the things that I found was that out of the 250 students who were admitted every year provisionally to a university, less than 1% ever went, got to college algebra. Instead, they were placed in a series of one to four remedial courses. And out of sheer boredom, impatience, frustration, stigmatization, students did not make it through those remedial courses. Um, so I had the bright idea of, of thinking, well, what would happen if we remediated math instead? And I made a deal with the math department. And my deal was, if you, <coughs> excuse me, if you can design an exit exam that guarantees that the students have mastered at least at a level of a C grade or better, college algebra, will you let me teach it anywhere I want? And will you let me, will you let me eliminate remedial education? And because, you know, the thing that I learned a long time ago, I took off the table immediately their greatest fear. The greatest fear was they were going to be watering down standards. Right? That they were going to be letting students through who actually hadn't held the standards of the university. So I put that right on the table. You design a test. They have to pass it. That's a non-negotiable, now let me design it the way I want. So what we did very, very quickly was we put everybody into college algebra. And, and instead of, of having a one-size-fits-all kind of curriculum, we did heavy, heavy assessment individually so I, could see, I would know exactly what your strengths and weaknesses were. And then we would design a program that well that would meet your needs. But it was also about putting you of a different kind of environment so you could get socialized to the practices that were valued in the academy. So, so we were organized here in groups of 10 so that you could be working on basic arithmetic but you could be in college algebra and that you could be working together. Right. Testing was pulled out of the classroom and was made with them in the evening. So there was a lot of, feed, a lot of feedback both instructionally and personally about how you were doing. Well, to make a long story short, in one year, two semesters, we went from 1% of students completing college algebra to 65% of students completing college algebra uh, with a C or better in 
three semesters, we had about 80 something percent. In four semesters, about 95, maybe five percent who just really, really needed more remediation would have a hard time. We tried this model in science, in literacy, in math, and found that again, when you start to change the functional system, right, and you saturate it with new forms of learning, new kinds of assistance with new tools, students could be really smart, right? And it was a model that worked so well that dominant students, dominant population students, uh, asked to be part of this course because they could really do well. And that's exactly what we wanted because the less we could stigmatize it, the better. So I share this metaphor of remediation, both in ways to help you think about how I'm thinking about changing policies. We want to re mediate policies in ways that will really support non-dominant students in the ways we've done it practically in school settings. Does this model make sense to you? I'm going, I'm doing a drive-by on these, so I need to make sure. Okay, so that's kind of a, a pervasive theme that I, I'm, th I'm gonna touch back on throughout this uh, presentation. And the reason I think this is so important to me is because school still is organized around very traditional notions of learning, very traditional ways of organizing learning, and ways that we call procedural display uh, from my colleague David Bloom. It looks like learning, it even sounds like learning, but it's not, right? It's not the deep and transformative kind of understandings that we want for students to uh, appropriate in the classes and in the environments that, that we're designing. I wanted to share with you the best example of procedural display I have ever found. And it was sent to me by one of my first students when I taught at Harvard. And it's a clip from Saturday Night Live. And I'm going to introduce you to this clip um, to, to uh, so that you can understand this notion of procedural display. And the clip is of, please come in and be that, sit down and we're pretty informal here, um, is of a French class taught by Monsieur Norbeck. What's important to know about Monsieur Norbeck is that his goal was not that you learn how to speak French, but rather that you learn how to sound Frenchy. Je vous prie, je vous prie, je vous 
case, but it really does <laughs> exemplify the kind of procedure that's like, and this looks like a lot of foreign language classes that I think a lot of us know. This is a really funny clip. It, it, it ends with him going to vacation in France, in Paris, and he gets lost. He's looking for the Musée d'Orsay, and he asks some Parisians for some directions. And so they say in the natural Parisian voice where it is, and then he starts to correct them. <laughs> and then they beat the hell out of him in the streets. It's really funny. But again, although this is a hyperbolic case, it really does resemble lots of ways what we've actually do uh, documented about the ways English learners are taught literacy in classrooms. And so I wanted to share with you just one brief example of what it would look like for some fifth graders in a class. Um, a group of very diverse English learners, many of whom knew quite a bit of English, had quite a bit of skill, and yet they were required to be part of these kinds of uh, literacy limits. This is what counts as writing for many children in California still, if you're an English learner. So um, you might want to do this one. This is really the only interactional kind of s slides we'll do. But I think this is, again, real life kind of procedure, this way this going on. And, and here's this clip. And the, the teacher tells the students that she's going to say a sentence. Remember, this is writing instruction but says not to write it until she says it. She says she will say it again little by little. She says, the rat ran up the net, the net, say it. The rat ran up the net. Okay, which word tells us what ran up the net? Raise your hand. Which word tells us what ran up the net? Hector? The rat. The rat, write that, and the kids write. All right, what did the rat do? Raise your hand, what did he do, Connie? Ran. That's the word that tells us what the rat did. Write it, and the kids write. What did the last three sentences, of, last three words of the sentence tell us? What did that tell us? What did, t what did that tell us? What did that? What did that tell us? And now you can't understand anything. Now, what did that tell us? The last three words of the sentence. What did those last three words tell us? That we went up the net. What did they tell us? Now that they're just saying stuff about going up the net. What does that tell us? And she points to the cards on the wall that say who, what, where, why, when, how. Someone finally says, why? Do those last three words tell us why? What do they tell us? The rat ran up the net. What do the last three words tell us? Wow. They tell us how? Up the net tells us how? Hmm? What? <laughs> when? Up the net tells us when. And now by this time, kids are just calling out guesses. And one of them says, where? Now if? Where? Where? Up the net. Doesn't that tell you where? Where, where he went, right? You guys are just yelling out words. Who, what, when? It doesn't tell us that. It tells us where. Right? The last three words. Now, when I tell you, as researching you in there, we couldn't figure out the answer either. We were as lost as the kids. And what it shows is when you dummy down literacy so much that it no longer looks like literacy, you know, smart people can't figure it out, right? And yet we see teachers who, of course, not for on choosing, are put in the situations where this kind of procedure display becomes normative kinds of um, literacy instruction for children. Not really that far off from uh, Monsieur Norbeck's notion of instruction. So how do you start to challenge this? And so I want to go back to the importance of putting the L word back in policy and the need to have more of us spend time on developing a much more robust science of learning. And this will be, this could be my whole talk, but I just want to spend one slide to tell you what this would look like. Schools generally privilege what we call vertical forms of expertise, right? This part right here. And that is the kinds of models that go from novice to expert, from immaturity to maturity, right? To, to barely starting to understand the discipline, discipline to adding up more knowledge until we become experts in that discipline, right? So it is the kind of decontextualized, more abstract kind of thinking that is privileged in schools. 
mainly in disciplinary areas. Right? So that's the kind of expertise and learning that we've all been socialized and are very familiar with. What we're some of us are trying to argue is that of course we need to develop vertical expertise. Right? This is not an argument against that kind of learning, but rather that if we're really going to start under developing policy that is going to make a difference, especially for students from non dominant communities, we need to have a theory of learning, of course this is for all people, not just for students from non dominant communities, that our theory of learning has to account for what takes hold as people move across their everyday lives. As people move across boundaries, across contexts, right? But there is learning going on there. When I work with my migrant farm worker students and they're crossing the border, there's a lot of learning going on there. And instead, what we've done is call that background knowledge, you know, experience, and never really privilege the kinds of repertoires of practice that get formed as people move across their everyday lives, right? And so we tend to dichotomize vertical and horizontal learning. And so in a very, very short statement, I want to say, because this, this is really the kind of work that I'm doing right now. So rather than dichotomizing home and school, informal and formal, and everyday and school-based, instead what's much more productive is to see how school-based knowledge and everyday practices can grow, really grow into one another. When you're really learning deeply, that's what happens. Right? It's not just you're using your background knowledge to get over here. Your background knowledge is not a bridge to somewhere else. Your background knowledge, your everyday practices, really can form the basis for which these school-based understandings will make sense. And I hope to give you an example of that, of that in, in a second. So very, very quickly through my theory of learning slide, is that we really need a push on on the, the way we're thinking about learning and development right now. Otherwise, we're going to continue to have imp impoverished policies and practices that are never going to kind of lead to that transformative understanding that we're trying to get students to do. Okay? So how do, you start, how do you escape this, what we call the encapsulation of schooling, that I think is really reinforced as so much of educational policy today? It helps create this, this this capsule, right, in which, in which students are actually, um, have very little opportunity to escape, right? So how do you start to do it? Well, with disciplinary knowledge, like science, some of the things we're trying to do is to get people to understand that you don't start out with little facts and factoids, but rather you want a curriculum that starts with the big ideas. What are the big ideas of science? What are the big ideas of whatever the discipline is? And you start with these big ideas, and that these big ideas grow into facts and details and personal history. So this is an example of how everyday and school days would come together, right? Big ideas would be part of that vertical, that kind of vertical expertise that we, we learn in the discipline. But it grows into facts that are part of discipline and everyday experience, details, and my own personal experience. These are the ways we know we can get people to start really appropriating much more robust notions of science, of mathematics, and, and other kinds of disciplines. And these are fundamental to the way we think about you know, all the areas of policy making right now. And I want to spend a little bit of time, oops, talking about literacy. That was my two sentences on science. Um, I've just been, I'm just come back from our NSF retreat in which we're actually working on developing policy for science learning. So it's very much in sync with what I'm saying. Um, but one of my concerns in developing policy at the federal level for literacy is that you know that under No Child Left Behind, the centerpiece was reading first. How many of you are familiar with reading first? So Reading First was a program first through third grade? Yeah. First and third. First and third. I was actually on the Reading First National Committee, but I locked it out. <laughs> a very different kind of experience. Um, so, that, so that Reading First was the 
centerpiece of No Child Left Behind. And one of the things that's happened in federal literacy policy is that we tend, we've tended to fund first elementary more than anything else. And we've also funded kind of fragmented cohorts of literacy policy. So we might have reading first, but we had very, very little for, for uh, early reading, right? We had a little early reading first. But then adolescent is treated separately. So what you, what you have in federal policy is a very fragmented way to think about literacy. In some ways, I think about it as kind of an inoculation theory of literacy, that if I give it to you in first grade, it's supposed to last you throughout your lifespan, right? And instead, we know that literacy is a lifelong process. And that even though I learned some fundamentals about literacy in first through third grade, that th those may be some of the building blocks, but that the developmental demands of literacy change across one's lifetime. The kinds of texts we read, the kinds of tasks, they have very, very different developmental demands. And those are generally not taught to teachers or made visible to teachers, nor to students, right? So you end up having a very kind of fragmented, incoherent approach to literacy. So one of, one of the things we recommended um, in, in my literacy policy uh, report was to develop a comprehensive agenda for literacy that went from zero through adult. Is that we start to recognize that, that again, literacy learning begins at birth, right? And that each kind of phase of one's life requires a very different set of dispositions and, and strategies and, and, and kinds of uh, experiences that need to be scaffolded for learning. And so uh, for the very first time, um, there is a modified version of what I was hoping that is part of the LEARN Act. Now, they didn't, they didn't uh, propose the zero through adult, but at least it's a pre-K pre to 12. So you're starting to see at least the very skeletal beginnings. I, th I still don't think it's robust enough, but it's kind of skeletal beginnings of a more coherent uh, uh, literacy agenda. That, 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 that in, its, in its conception and its implementation start to see that you do need a continuum. That adolescent readers, right, um, really are struggling with a whole different set of demands um, to do the kinds of, uh, to read the kinds of texts and do the kinds of writing that they are. So what we're really hoping then, and that we should be pushing for, is not this piecemeal kind of literacy approach, but again, a very comprehensive approach that recognizes that literacy is, is this dynamic process, a lifelong process that requires a whole different set of tools, at least a rearrangement of those tools and uses throughout, throughout one's lifespan. And that literacy learning for special populations like English learners not be a side attraction, but it should be part of the conceptualization of the coherent literacy policy. So that when we're talking about what students need at pre-K, that for the first time we've got to think about well, what does pre-K literacy mean for dual language learners? What are the additional, we know that we have this, that learning, learning is the same for all students, but what are the additional developmental demands that a poor child or an English learner has in acquiring that kind of set of expertises at that age group? Those should be centrally embedded in a coherent literacy policy, not as a sideshow as they have been historically. So that is, that is also one of the things, and as you'll see shortly, yes, we do need a separate set of policies for dual language learners to meet those special needs, but that doesn't include the fact that they need to be part of, centrally, of a coherent literacy policy off of the nation, and the same thing with, with science. And, I, and we do need to rethink completely, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time thinking about dual language learners and after school programs. Um, but to do so, I, and to achieve kind of race and culture sensitive policies, I think we also need, in addition to a robust theory of learning, kind of dynamic notions of culture. And this is my one sentence mantra that my colleague Fred Erickson 
said to me after he read, read the piece of Barbara Rogoff and I wrote on cultural ways of learning. He said, oh, Chris, I get it. You, you're trying to say that 100% of Mexicans don't hit piñatas 100% of the time. <laughs> And I said, that's it. That's the 100% piñata rule that researchers and practitioners need to remember. That members of cultural communities may share, right, and engage in the same cultural practice. Like Mexicans may all have piñatas at birthday parties. Of course, if you live in the Southwest, so do a whole lot of other people, so that breaks that day. But even, even, let's just say, even if we did, the way we value and use, right, and the frequency of which we would use the piñata would vary tremendously from person to person and household to household. So the 100% piñata rule, I think, is a really important kind of bumper sticker that we need to have when we make policy. And I actually... Um, said this to policymakers when they invited me to spend a week with them at the Aspen Institute that was um, in Cancun, not a bad place to go for a retreat with uh, 20 members of the Senate and the House. This is when they still had moderate Senate and House people that could go together. And one of my goals was to help, how would I help them understand this more dynamic notion of culture and how it affects policy. And so I came up with my, the help of my dear colleague Mike Rose, um, the kind of notion of this binocular vision. That what often happens with policy is that we make, we make policy with this lens. We make it for the whole cohort. We make it for English learners. We make it for special ed kids. But we forget when we do that, or we ignore, that there is more variability within that cohort than across, right? There's more, vari more variability within a group than across a group. So part of the thing that I was trying to help policymakers understand is this need for this binocular vision that while they would kind of define the need by, by studying the cohort, that as a group, English learners or special needs students, et cetera, as a cohort, they have this need. But policy, policy shouldn't be made with that lens. Pol the next step for policymakers is to just understand that the, they're getting, in part, the regularity, right? There's a regularity in that cohort. What they're not getting is the variance within that cohort. And what happens as a result is that we have one-size-fits-all approaches to addressing the needs of X group, right? So you can see, I can understand the pragmatism, of course, of defining the felt need on the cohort. But as a policymaker who's interested in, in long-term effectiveness, and, and, and both fiscally and in terms of practice, I should be accounting for the variability within that cohort so that my policies are more dynamic, that my policies are much more resilient and addressing the, the kind of range of needs or the flexibility to address the range of needs that students within that cohort have. Does that make sense to you policymakers in here? Yeah? So when I was talking to, this, uh, to the, the group of uh, legislators about this, um, one well-known uh, legislator whose name I won't mention said, oh, I get it, Chris. So, so what if we just had all teachers learn to speak Spanish? Right. And I said, no, that's not what this, uh, this is not what this binocular vision is trying to help you see. It's really trying to help you develop much more dynamic and nuanced understandings of the communities around which you were developing practice. Right. Sure. So, uh, so if I look at... Um, I mean, I think, for example, the ELL, are you talking about, say, there, there could be differences like, in language? So, so, so advising policy for ELL students, right. policymakers should be prompted of one variation that is different languages. That's one way, right? So let's just take the notion, because I'll, I'll skip ahead, put you into that, because let's just think about dual language learners. There are so many myths around our understanding of that population, right? First of all, right, first of all, 77% um, of dual language learners are not immigrant children. They were actually born here in the U.S. 
So how does that challenge the paradigm that's being developed around the, the policies? If, if, because if they were born here and they have parents who are immigrants, what might that tell you about their language practices? What might that suggest to you? They're speaking their language at home. But what else? Pardon? Or not. Or not. Because it's television or having hair in another language. So you can imagine a whole variable range of kinds of language practices in which these children have depending on a whole host of things, right? Um, so we know that, in, that dual language learners again, often have a family member who, t who speaks language at home, but the practices of that family may be very different based on the family's socioeconomic status, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet we make policy for dual language learners as if they have the same kind of history of involvement with literacy, right? So one way to think about this, instead of doing the remediation approach, which is kind of deficit, all these kids think this way, it's much more productive to say, what is that student's history of involvement with literacy at home and at school? And that helps you kind of understand the variance within these populations, right? So from a policy perspective, that tells me lots of things. It certainly tells me something about how teachers need to be prepared. It should tell me something about the kind of curricula that might be available to them. It should tell me about the variable kinds of supports that students might need. It tells me a whole lot of things that wouldn't come up if I'm just thinking about them as a more monolithic group. But does, that, does that make sense? So what's happened with dual language learners, for example, is this homogenization, that they are really all come out of the same cloth and we've got to treat them in the same ways. And, and we think about it and what happens with this, what we call the sameness and fairness principle that is at work in a lot of federal policy, and that is if we all have the same thing, then we're being fair and equitable. And what that does, it flattens out differences that matter, right? So a more robust policy around the language learners would be sensitive to those, those different developmental demands that that population or that child would have so that it wouldn't, this is where differences matter, so that it wouldn't stigmatize, but it would also not ignore those really important kind of developmental differences that different populations have. There are so many issues around English learners that I wouldn't have time to cover, but I wanted to highlight a few that we're trying to deal with in policy. And in fact, um, the federal government doesn't come and knock on your door, you have to go knock on its door. And one of the most successful models uh, that I think I know of has been a recent um, effort by a group of us involved in English language research. Um, Kenji Hukuda, Dan Argus, Patricia Gambada, uh, Jennifer O'Day, the names you all know well, I'm a part of it, really took it upon ourselves to kind of leverage the research that we know about robust educational practices for English learners and to draft a set of recommendations. We did it for Race to the Top and now we're doing it for ESEA. And we've done it in a way that we disseminated it, we had press briefings around it, and we meet regularly, regularly, with people in the Senate, people in the House, right, um, people in the department. In fact, one of the assistant secretaries who's drafting ESEA um, reported to us and said, what I really like about meeting with you guys is you're coming to me with solutions to really difficult problems and we're marshalling kind of the research to help us understand that. Right? So we know it's possible to start making entries and we're really hopeful that we will have a, we'll see some of this depending on how the elections go uh, in a few months. But if things hold, we think we have, we're getting a lot of traction on English learners for a variety of reasons. One, there is very, very little, there has been very, very little expertise at the federal level in the last administration around English learners. 
it's amazing how little expertise there was up and down the departments. So that provided an entry point for us to kind of come in and be part of the conversation and make recommendations. So I wanted to share with you just a couple to give you an idea of how we're leveraging research to influence policy. And believe it or not, this is one of the more con controversial ones. And that's why I'm saying I think we need to reframe what civil rights counts because we're actually getting pushback from some civil rights group. Um, and let me see if I can explain why. Under No Child Left Behind, the reporting of subgroup achievement was seen as a real win for civil rights, right? But for the very first time, we were reporting on populations that had been largely invisible under No Child Left Behind um, in previous uh, iterations. That's very true, and I think that cannot, that gain cannot be minimized. But at the same time, that's still a very, very imperfect kind of measure. And I want to explain to you why. And so some of the civil rights groups are very hesitant to let go of that because it took so long to get, make that gain that moving it seems like we're giving something up. So let me, let me explain what, what this problem is and what our recommendation is. Right now, if you're an English learner under the current accountability system of No Child Left Behind, once you get reclassified, you are taken out of the English learner cohort, right? And the schools no longer have to report on you as an English learner. You're now lost over here in part of the mush of English learners or English speakers. So what happens, there, there are multiple consequences for that. Uh, one consequence is it's, it's kind of, you always have the bottom, so to speak. Schools can never demonstrate any kind of progress that they've made with the students because they're not reporting on them, they're now over here. So you're always left with the students who are still learning English to report on. So this kind of suppressing the population in a kind of really unfair way. But I think there's a, a more serious kind of equity issue from my perspective. And that is because of the accountability systems and all the all of the carrots and sticks that are attached to it, there's been a real push to reclassify students very quickly. And that's the Arizona case right now, right? A real move to reclassify. So what happens is these students are moved over into regular population. They no longer qualify for Title III support monies. And now they should be the responsibility of Title I. But what happens is because they've shown proficiency in some way, People equate that with academic language proficiency or academic literacy proficiency, and these students are getting lost in the system. They are, some of them are doing okay, but some of them just stall, and a number of them are actually regressing. And, our, and the new data are showing that there are sizable numbers of these kids that have been reclassified, but no one's accounting for any longer, right? So we think that if that pattern persists, that if we track these kids, these would be the ones who are dropping out. But even though they've shown some success, they've now, now started out and there's no support for them. So what we're recommending is that for accountability purposes only, only for accountability purposes, that we have a group called Total EL and that students for, throughout their schooling experience remain in that cohort. Not instructionally, not any other way, but in terms of reporting. So that there can be some accountability for how these students do across each grade level, right? And not just for the English learners. We also are building into it the issue of time. Because you need to have, there are some long-term ELLs who have been in English learner category for years and years. And that's because the time factor hasn't come in. So there's two kinds of time issues that you want to think about in EL policy. One is how much time it takes to become proficient in academic literacy. Five to seven years, right, is the, the general agreement. That's one, that's one dimension of time, but the second dimension of time is how much time they've been in school. 
And we think that a robust accountability system really has to, has to factor in. How long has the student been in the schooling system? And where are they in terms of the achievement, the language proficiency, and their academic achievement? Those are really important factors. So part of what we're trying to do, and we have very kind of really sophisticated measures to do it, is to help the federal government think about ways that I think really get at the core equity issues in terms of schooling for English learners. Does that make sense? Yeah? I'm not going to go through too many more because um, this becomes a revolving door, right? Uh, and what you're left with are very, really weak data and a weak accountability system.